Welcome everyone to Zephan 864. Uh, I'm Eric. I go by Cal on the Discord and on the community in general. And tonight we're going to be having a, a Craft Your Own Tools for Learning and Fun presented by Arbrins. Um, just normal kind of background. Um, we have quite a few new folks here at DC 864, so definitely welcome. Uh, just basic rules for Defcon 864. We have those posts online at dc864.org, uh, but to summarize them, it's just to be a decent human to other humans. That is all we ask. Our general meeting format is main presentations can go anywhere from 25 minutes to 45 minutes. Uh, after the main presentation, we then go through and do a sweep through the room of basic intros. You can give your name, your alias, your name and alias. You can even give a little bit about where you work or you can give none of the above. Uh, after that, we open up the floor to open project time. So that generally is if you have something you're working on, something you're passionate about, and you just want a spot to, to plug it. Um, sometimes we've had folks come in and talk about different conferences. Do we have a member from another, uh, actually two members from two different meetup groups. So if you represent other types of groups in the community, you can also plug any type of like meetings or events that might be happening in your groups that you're also a part of. Uh, just call those out. We've got Upplug, Hack Greenville, Carpet Gaming. Yeah, Hack That's a Ruby meetup. And a Ruby meetup. Meet That's yeah. right. Um, so, anything like that, I normally will talk a little bit about a thing called a MUD <laughs> in that segment. So, the MUD update. I might have a MUD update tonight. And then after that, we tend to just break for open social. We were doing villages where we broke up in the red village and the blue village, but we're kind of changing that up with this year. Uh, so it's just open conversation, you know, talk to the, the folks around you. We tend to wrap up, I think we have to be out of here at 8 p.m. is the, the kickout time. So we start wrapping that up at about 7.45, 7.50 to get everything back where it goes. And then there's generally an after party, basically dinner. Uh, at, we're at this location, we tend to go to a place called Bar Margaret. Some of the best burgers in Greenville, in my opinion. Good truffle fries, too. Good truffle fries, too. Mm -hmm. Shout out. And then if we are at our secondary location, which is the Pelham Library, we tend to go to Double Dogs, um, which is over in Pelham. Usually there would be other announcements like conferences or anything else notable, but I don't think we have anything of note. With that, we're going to turn things over to Arbrins to get through as well. Cool. So, so a little bit of who I am, free and open source software advocate, probably first in my technologist role and hobbying and professional life as much as possible, security enthusiast, and I do that uh, part-time and then full-time and then part-time again uh, because of career changes. And I also le lead the Red Team Village for DC864. This last month we had uh, some instructions put out there for hosting your own juice shop app, which is a vulnerable web app. And this is this is kind of the next step of once you've gone through some of that basic training um, and met, learning a methodology for testing a web app, uh, you start to wonder, okay, how do I how do I discover new things in web apps, or how do I discover new uh, efficiencies in my own methodology based off of what I like, uh, what I like in testing, or what I've seen in testing that tools don't really cover for me as well. Uh, Next slide, please. And so I, I hope to show you the benefits of creating your own tools. Uh, I also want to show you a little bit of benefits of liter literate programming, what that is, some of the uh, tools that you can use to do literate programming with. And all of this has an underlying intent and message that you create your own tools for your specific goals, whether that's personal goals, professional goals, uh, but they do need to be your goals because ultimately it is your tool that you're creating. Oh, also, uh, totally not an indoctrination into Emacs. <laughs> I promise. All right, so need a little bit of participation. Why would we create a new tool if there already exists something out there? And so why would you reinvent the wheel? Any ideas? Go ahead. All right. Uh, any use cases you can think of for a will that might be wrong? Got a narrow tire in front of you. Climbing upstairs. Great. 
and, and exactly. So you, you have to think about uh, the the scenario in which you want to get your output. What is your desired outcome, and how can you best achieve that? If it's using an off-the-shelf tool, uh, great, more power to you. Um, but sometimes you're going to learn a little bit more and probably be more satisfied with making your own scripting or automation in some form or fashion. Uh, taking the tire example a little bit further, uh, we might reinvent the tire if we hated getting flat tires and wanted to drive to the next service station. And so run flat tires now exist and come on a lot of cars by default. Uh, you can look at that flatness of a tire as sort of an attack surface. Attack surface could be where rubber literally meets the road. Um, it could be where it rotates back into the, the hidden wheel. And so how do you attack that as an attacker? Do you put out things onto the road? Uh, do you try to sabotage the, the mechanism of the uh, wheel itself that the tire goes to? And you can think about software this way too and the tools that you use. Next slide, please. Uh, and going down that, that reason why, uh, which is, again, your goals, you can learn more about how the underlying technology works. Uh, you can look at it from either examining current tools and the source code available to you. Um, if you know the programming language or if you don't, you can try to begin picking it up. might be a little bit more difficult. Uh, you can audit some of the tools that you use. You can go through their documentation and learn it further. Uh, this is a way that you can begin learning about why you want to create a new tool or what your new tool would have in it. Um, you can learn about the protocols itself. If you're going for a web app, you can learn about the HTTP protocol. You can learn about TCP and, and really get as fine grain and granular as you want in your creation of the tool um, to help your methodology. Uh, yep, going down further, the, uh, sorry, <laughs> got to blank a little bit. When you are specifically looking at the information being exchanged, you might know that uh, there's flags on a, a TCP packet and you want to see what those flags are for whatever reason the toilet you're creating but the response or the display of the information on what you're using doesn't show that by default uh, or it might not be able to show it at all depending on what's being communicated to you and so you can begin to take that information and and show it so you can filter your display to how you process information better um, but then you can also filter that information so that the next tool that you pick up in your methodology can receive that better. So maybe it's a CSV file that you're exporting as, as a very specific CSV file because your company has created something that imports CSVs to do the rest of the vulnerability management process or, or whatever. Um, or you just want to do it because you like the, uh, you might go from in-map to a directory busting Tool, and so you're going to script that so that you don't have to manually copy and paste commands each time. So there's always a purpose, and again, this comes back down to your goal specifically. Next slide. Uh, and then you want to make your future self think your past self. Uh, this is really important when you are starting to program your own scripts and automation. And that's why uh, I advocate for literate programming in a lot of ways, because you can document uh, what you're doing, what you're thinking at that time, and put links and images together along the source code. Um, but to really drive that home, don't be afraid to draw out your own process flow. Just get a blank piece of paper, draw some boxes, and start with uh, A and end with C and put your inputs on the left side, your outputs on the right side. I don't actually care if you put them on left and right, just do it in a way that makes sense to you. And then be able to draw the 
the steps that you know you need to take to get from inputs to desired outputs. Uh, going back to the literate programming, there's some tools. I use Emacs and org mode, uh, Jupyter notebooks. They offer literate programming. You can put markdown and then have your code and execute it within the same notebook. I highly recommend these if you are just starting out with programming. Um, you can you can link Stack Overflow links along with just a summary or what worked in the markdown, and then customize it specifically in your code instead of having just a bunch of grayed out comments. You have headers and nice formatting and bold and all of that that makes reading uh, easier. And then another another reason why maybe you want to learn a new programming language or a new uh, tech stack or a new piece of software that uh, you're, you're specializing in or just find more interesting. And so creating your own tools to interact with those um, or even uh, using a new environment with existing like language that you know will just make you better with it. Again, going back to the goals. All right, so I did pronounce, I did attempt to pronounce this, uh, but this is that loop. <laughs> You define your goals, you define the methodology, you start, okay, good. You, you pick the language, uh, whatever tech you want to do, and then you do the proof of concept and you begin iterating on that. Um, it's, it's simple, but I do not want to be uh, selling an easy solution. You will put in work, you will beat your head against the wall as you are learning new things. Uh, I'm just hoping to provide a better framework so when you eventually um, or maybe if you go ask for help from somebody, you can say, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm using. And I'm running into this awful error every single time. And then people can begin to, to put pieces together and help work through it. Maybe learn something new. All right, so going into the defining the methodology, I'm using an example here. We'll be using the example of a directory brute forcing tool uh, today. And so I'm going to run through the steps here and then ask some questions. So we'll run nmap against the target, maybe just port 80, 443, excluding other, other ports that a web server might be on. Then we want to check if that port is open, is a web server actually on it? And then we run the directory brute forcing tool. So we need to supply a list of directories. We need to then connect to the target and then loop through all of those lists um, against the target. And then we need to display responses. Maybe we display all responses, 200s, uh, non 404s. And so we can ask ourselves some questions here based off of a goal of creating a directory brute forcing tool. Do we care about the noise of NMAP? Uh, we might. And, and then we have to ask ourselves the question, do we care about the noise that a brute forcer does and if we do then maybe maybe we are in a situation where there's a few small uh subset of directories we want to test and we're in a maybe a red team situation where we can test randomly between eight and five um from one person's computer and we can craft our tool to do that so that the output still gets automated to us and we don't have to remember to log in at 2 or 3 p.m to do that uh, we need to ask ourselves, do we want to get anything from the uh, HTTPS exchange if we're using HTTPS? If we know the target uh, and they provide a certificate, do we want to harvest anything off of that before continuing on? Um, other things to consider is what's returned in the HTTP response. We have the response code. Uh, we might have a body, might have uh some content header responses that we didn't even ask for we might ask for um content headers and see if they give us a response these are all things to consider in a tool that a off-the-shelf brute forcing tool might not give you right away uh, and then finally if i say i want just the response codes do i want only non 404s that could, uh, that could display a whole plethora of things that I might not be ready to handle. 
go on a display just 200s. Some web apps only respond with 200s, even though there's nothing there. Do I need to filter by the response body size? Tons of questions, and this is where you start to really answer what your code needs to do, going back to your goals. How much do you want to learn? How much do you want to dive into? Um, at least in this proof of concept chunk. Any questions before moving on there? All right. Did I put this in twice? I did. Yeah. You can skip this. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, so tiny text, but from just a, a screenshot of my literate programming setup, I have the left example. It's my explanation of a CISA advisory. You can see the link here. And then uh, it's based off of Lockbit lock 3.0. And I know I wanted to emulate the files that it dropped on a host to specifically test to see if, if those were picked up at all by um, an antivirus. And then I also wanted to test some of the actions they take uh, with those files that I picked out non-arming actions. Uh, but this is part of my, my file here, is I, I listed out the files that I wanted to drop on the host. I can put the files in, uh, I didn't put that screenshot up. I can put the files in as a source coded block and have it create that file in the, in the literate programming config. Uh, so, so one of the things, things I do like about Emacs over Jupyter in this aspect is I can have those files as a, a tangle here, and I could have uh, like services.xml, and then when I execute the entire file, it'll create that, drop it into my C2 server, and then the agent, whenever it's executed, will pull that from the C2 server. Uh, this config specifically helps me because if I decided, or let's say a client came to me and asked for, hey, you know, we want to really blow up a computer, try to encrypt it thoroughly using uh, exactly what the CISA advisory had in it, or very similar to what the CISA advisory had in it, I would know picking this up months from now that I already had these files included, and I don't have to scrape through a directory that might have 15 different files in it with different names, different versions, whatever. Uh, the, the right, right example, example, though, is me trying to learn uh, how to do C Sharp with uh, my Linux host and specifically compiling it. And I was having a hard time doing it in an automated fashion. And I was linking uh, Stack Overflow comments. I was linking Microsoft documentation. Um, I had examples of what XML files I tried for creating the project. And I just told myself didn't work, wrong build program, and uh, finally got to the solution and learned quite a bit about why uh, Microsoft hates everybody at the end of it. Uh, but one of the, the things I like about this here, and you can't see it, but down here I have another heading that is a to-do heading. And so in Emacs, if I put a to-do heading in an org mode file, then when I open up Emacs, we have it sit. Uh, configured is it will have my agenda with all my to-do items. So I now know, hey, I need to go check on this article, or this is just the next step I need to take. And that's a good way of uh, telling my future self um, where I am in a program instead of, uh, again, just having raw source code files and then picking it up maybe two, three weeks from now when I have time again. and having to read through everything, debug what I already wrote, it's kind of left there for me really nicely. All right. So then uh, mentioned defining the methodologies, uh, defining what you want to do with your goal. And now you have to use, or you have to decide what you're going to use. Since I'm creating a directory brute forcing tool, I know I'm going to select a programming language to do that and need to ask, uh, again, again, with, with your, your goals, goals informing you, you no, I'm, I'm going to say, say that every, every almost every slide, uh, what abstraction level of programming language do you want to do? Are you trying to learn C networking? If so, God bless you, but that's not what my goal is here. 
Uh, if you are trying to do um, like EDR bypassing, then you might have to use C, and that's also okay. Or maybe you use Python just because you want to challenge. There's a, a bunch of different reasons. And at that abstraction level, uh, that's when you're choosing how close to machine language you get versus uh, a very high level language. Otherwise, also want to select your paradigm. And what I mean by that is either functional, programming, object-oriented, procedural, something that combines all three. Uh, if you don't care about that, then you probably will pick a language based off of just abstraction. Um, or maybe you just want to learn something new because you want a challenge, maybe a puzzle or, or something. And that's all fine. It's your tool. You get to, you get to choose all these things, but you do have to make a choice. Uh, and then also choosing a programming language based off of something you hate. If you, uh, I don't really have a good example of this, but if you know you hate handling one aspect of uh, Java because Java gets a lot of hate for various reasons, then maybe choose a language that doesn't deal with that, that has um, what you don't like from that language already abstracted out for you. Uh, consider your module support. We have to write everything from scratch. Is there a healthy library to choose from? Is it a supported library? Um, will you need to reference some obscure YouTube video to get it working? Um, all of these are consideration. And then looking at the documentation for the language itself, is it something you can understand? Is it something you could grow to understand? Uh, and then not just the documentation, but consider if you will need support, what the community looks like. Are they toxic? Are they pretty open? Are there, just hop in an IRC channel and see if anybody alive is still in there. Uh, all of these are, are considerations. And if you're in the DCA64 Discord, uh, just see if anybody uses it in the programming channel. <laughs> we use a whole bunch of different things. Uh, but for today, I'll be using Guile because I wanted to, I wanted to better, uh, better learn how the GNU ecosystem is using Guile for its integrations and uh, extensibility within other GNU projects. It also has a, a pretty neat C library that if you use some of its C functions, then you can inherently use Guile to extend it. So you don't need Guile to just extend Guile. You can use Guile to extend C program to writing. And uh, also the REPL. I just like REPL support when I'm doing stuff like this. And Python has it, so don't it's not a scary thing, it's read, eval, print, loop. Uh, and it's whenever you type in Python into your terminal and you get the three greater than symbols, whichever way you're looking at me from. Uh, and you can do print, parentheses, hello world, that's, you're in a REPL then. Uh, and so those were what I wanted, those were my goals. And then uh, the brute forcing, uh, uh, the directory brute forcing tool is more of a way of saying, hey, I've done this in Python before. I want to see what it's like in Guile because that's going to help me learn the language. I'm using the tool to help me learn the language. I'm not using a language to help me learn a methodology in this case. Next. I did a quick proof of concept. Uh, so this was a very quick initial push. I think it took me all of a couple of hours to to get through the code isn't as important as getting the output that you want from your inputs. I hard coded the inputs for all of this. Um, but again, your tool, you can do what you want. Uh, if I were to uh, try to push this to GitHub and definitely clean it up some, add some more comments. But uh, this is what I, I used initially. And it helps me begin learning the structure of the language specifically, but also the structure of the brute forcing itself. I need to have a target. I need to have a list of uh, extensions, the, the URI, and then I need to connect to it and get that response and handle it appropriately. Next, please. <clears throat> All right, so then once you get that proof of concept, I'd recommend 
uh, going back to your uh, your list, define what you defined as your methodology, and start to clean up uh, what the the language and the environment that you're working with can actually handle. Uh, you know your basic structure. You know uh, from that proof of concept. And so, in this case, I've segmented it out in two different sections. Uh, one, I need to read in the list of paths, um, the list of extensions from the file. And then I need to append that to the target, and then I need to loop through that string uh, or those strings multiple times, get a response code, and then display that along with the extension um, to tell me what worked and what didn't work. Uh, this is where you can get as detailed as you want, detailed as you need. Don't be afraid to do formatting uh, with your print statements to get it nice and pretty, however you want it. It is your tool. All right. Yeah, so I just took my inputs here. I hard coded them. You can see I put the, the text file here and then just the test website. Uh, if you are trying to create a tool like this for the Red Team Village, use your juice shop app target. Uh, I would highly recommend that. And in Python, uh, it might be a little bit easier if you're more familiar with that, or if you want to pick up a new language, don't be afraid to hard code things in, and unless you're trying to sell it. Uh, next, please. Has anybody seen this meme before? Okay, so uh, I've seen this a few times, and I'm going to do it to you all, uh, because this isn't really a talk about how to program a brute forcer in Guile, it's how to uh, it's, it's why, why you should create your own tools for uh, attacking or defending. Um, and, and so, so next slide, this is the rest of the owl. Uh, so, so I've just stepped through and created the other procedures that I needed for uh, handling the response code, getting the response code, handling, uh, changing the strings to URI objects, and then ultimately displaying it out uh, how I wanted to over here. Uh, but this, once you've looped through enough to get to a stage like this, it's really important to ask yourself, what are the next steps? And so some of the next steps I thought of was removing the hard-coded inputs. I want to have an argument slot or even a file that it reads from that it handles this for me. Um, I want to confirm that HTTPS can work. I haven't tested that yet. Uh, I, want I want to display, display the page, page size because I know you, 200 response codes can often just be something that's returned to you because it's easier uh, to deceive you than to uh, give you a 404 and let you know exactly what's up and down. Uh, and then also one thing I know from my hack the box days is I wanted to highlight admin and login extensions specifically. Those were always nice. What are some next steps you could think of from a tool like this with the basics that you saw there? Or even tools that you've used that you wish, hey, there's a feature there. I wish this had. Good one. Yeah, for sure. Like a, a list of posts. Uh, I'd piggyback off of that and even say list of virtual hosts that you can Put on those too. Mm. Definitely. Mm. Absolutely. And yeah. Obviously, we for specific files down. Oh, PDFs, just download it. <laughs> um, but I mean, it really goes back to what's the intent? Exactly. What you're actually trying to do. Yep. yep. So that's the that's, that's the talk. talk. I definitely, definitely challenge you, especially, especially since we're doing the the basics of web app security. security. If there's something, something you want to automate, automate put it in the the Red Team Village channel. channel. Um, I, will I will gladly contribute to it if you put it on GitHub. Uh, just, just to, to kind of collaboratively, collaboratively learn a little bit.
any other questions or times you tried it and bombed or didn't bomb? I bombed a lot, for sure. I, I would like to, to point out the extreme uh, of the literary program. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, I, was, I was in a, a, a job, I was doing some analytic anal, uh, work, um, and I was always writing my own uh, uh, code to just make my job easier. And uh, somebody had, you know, I had left that office and went to the hotel. Somebody had asked me to come back and, and, and help um, uh, with one of these processes. Set up, and so I started down the path of, of trying to figure them out. I started just cursing the guy who wrote the code constantly, like, Who the hell did this? It's just horrible. And then I saw something that was, was, was an identifier, and I was like, Damn it, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just throwing it out there. Your code always looks worse than anyone else's two years later. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> I, I, I do, do like, like the, the literate literate programming because it's often I have gone back and I've, uh, just, just for example, for, for say maybe four, four years, years ago or so, I learned, uh, maybe, maybe not, not learned, learned, I understood how to use, use an object, object or a class in Python, Python for the first time. Like, like if my eyes were open, I was enlightened, and it was great. Uh, and, and as, as I, started I started going back, back to old code, I was like, like everything's going, going to be an object, object which does have its uh, drawbacks, drawbacks in a lot of cases. <laughs> uh, so, so then, then I, I... <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, when, when I say when I say I learned what a, a class was in Python, I also then took that enlightenment to Bash. I was like, I'm going to make it everything an object in Bash, uh, and so. Uh, and, and now, now unfortunately, unfortunately, I've gone back, back the, the other way. I learned a lot about functional programming <laughs> over the last year, and I, I think I have a healthy combination of the two, but I'm, I'm sure I will disagree with myself a year from now. You go de my p lo pite po fo koto ra loop. Did you make that up? Oh, I completely, I completely made, made that, that up. up. I, was I was thinking, thinking the of the OODA loop. No, no, I know. I, 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 I was tracking that. It was just it's the first time I've seen that particular. And I like it. Uh, I've, I've been, been, I've been looking, for, for, looking at the OODA, OODA loop for like weeks now, now. And, and I was, I was like, like, I need, I need to have my own loop for this presentation. I will admit when you when you were saying it, I lost track. Uh, I can't promise what you said. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, if I, I say, say it again, it'll be different. <laughs> <laughs> I, did I did try to rehearse it, though. I, 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 I promise. I tried, tried to commit this to memory, and I, I could, could not. not. <laughs> it probably. Yeah. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you.